Oh God, may that be our prayer every day. God, not a day goes by that we don't need you. Help us never get to a point where we think we don't need you, Father. Tonight, as we look at what your son Jesus did for us on the cross, I pray that it would reverberate all through our lives. That the gospel would not just be something that was for us the day that you saved us, God, but for all of our life from that point forward to all of eternity. God, may we never stop needing you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll turn to Isaiah chapter 53, that's where we'll be tonight. I'm sorry to inform you that we will not be providing s'mores afterwards. You can buy your own. Isaiah 53. We'll get there in a minute. We're going to do a little uh, traveling before we get there. The human race, I think, is plagued mainly by two things, and that's uh, pride and shame. And I think that pride always comes first. I think that's what the Bible teaches. Pride comes first and shame quickly follows. They go hand in hand. They're always together. Pride leads us to sin in many different ways, and when we sin, shame follows immediately. The best picture that we have of this is in the Garden of Eden, in the first few chapters of the Bible with our parents, Adam and Eve. They, uh, Satan has used their pride to get a, a, a foothold in their lives, mainly Eve, first off. She, he appeals to her pride, saying, God is holding out on you. God's holding out on you, and you could have so much more. You could be like God. So why don't you uh, eat this fruit here that he told you you shouldn't eat? Uh, and she, she took the bait. All right, she bit. Pun intended, I guess. Um, but this led to shame instantly. You know the story. Uh, Adam comes along, and he does the same, and instantly they both know that they are naked. They didn't know that they were naked before this, They sin against God, and then all of a sudden shame has entered into their life, and they know that they're naked, and so they try to hide their nakedness by sowing fig leaves um, to cover their nakedness. It's interesting to note, though, that after, after they have sown fig leaves to cover themselves, God comes, and they still hide from him. So they've covered their nakedness, or so they thought, but they still hide from him because they're still ashamed of their sin, and this tells me that uh, you can try to hide your sin and try to suppress your shame in any way you want, but the penetrating gaze of God will see through it every time. He will see through our attempts to cover up our shame every single time. Fig leaves will not do, and neither will anything else. Pride leads us to sin. Sin causes us to feel ashamed. This is the vicious cycle that every single one of us sees ourselves in. We sin out of pride and that leads us to shame and then we just go on and on and the cycle goes on and on. Here's what I want to deal with tonight though. How do you break out of it? How do you break out of this vicious cycle? And I want to tell you first off from the get-go that it's impossible to break out of the cycle on your own. We need help. Isaiah 53 Verse 5 is the verse we're going to look at tonight. That's our way out of the cycle here. Hopefully it will make sense to you after we're done looking at it. Our way out of this cycle is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is all at once, and here's how, you need to hear me this on this, it is all at once terrifying and beautiful. The gospel of Jesus Christ is all at once terrifying and beautiful. It is going to answer our pride, and it is going to answer our shame. It's going to answer pride in a very uh, straight-up manner, and then it's going to answer our shame in a very loving, gracious manner. So let us read Isaiah 53, 5, and then we'll, we'll start looking at pride and shame. Famous passage here. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. And so the he in this passage, 
him who we are speaking about is Jesus. This is the famous prophecy about the suffering servant of God who is Jesus. And it is prophesying about the day when he will be crucified for your sins and my sins. That's what uh, Isaiah is talking about here. And so first we're going to deal with pride. The first half of the verse deals with pride. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The key here is to hear our. Now, if you fancy yourself a human, then you need to include yourself in the hour, in the O-U-R there, okay? So you are included here in the group of people who wounded Christ by your transgressions and crushed him by your iniquities. Pride bristles at this, though. Pride doesn't want to hear this. Pride is what says, I actually deserve to be in the place that God is occupying. That's where I should be. That's what pride is. Pride can't be wrong. Pride always points the finger at other people. So yeah, you guys might have killed Jesus, but not me. That's pride. You following what pride means? Jesus, though, here's the deal with the crucifixion of Jesus. It catches us all red-handed. It catches us with our hand in the proverbial cookie jar. Nothing deals a bigger blow to my pride and your pride than you being told that you were one of the people who murdered Jesus. Your sin actually put Jesus on the cross. Nothing will deal a bigger blow to our pride than that. See, to be proud, like I said, is to think that you're never wrong. Uh, but the cross of Jesus says you couldn't be more wrong. You have reached the pinnacle of wrongness by being involved in the murder of the Son of God. You cannot be proud and still accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not possible. Isaiah says that it was our sins that put him there. The cross of Jesus should break down your pride. It tells us that we have nothing in and of ourselves to be proud of. Now, there's two types of pride. I'll break it up into two uh, categories for you tonight. There's pride that, uh, that comes mainly from lost people, okay? And so what I mean by that is lost people act like lost people. And so they don't understand the things that we do because they're not in church and they're not hearing them taught, okay? And so uh, what I mean by that is their pride is one that is just kind of brazenly and openly against God. They view the gospel as foolish and as uh, something for small-minded people. They view us as small-minded people. This is an open attack on God. This is uh, what I would call non-religious pride. But then, and what probably most of us in here tonight are guilty of, is the religious side of pride. We are not going to openly and brazenly attack God and say that the gospel is for small-minded people. We will actually sing about it every Sunday. But we resemble the uh, Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 where he came to pray. Jesus is talking about him. He came to pray and alongside him was a tax collector. And the Pharisee, he, he really said this. You can look it up, Luke 18. It's actually the first sermon I ever preached at uh, Crestview. So if you were here, you might remember that. But anyways, um, he actually says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, extortioners and, and tax collectors, that I'm not like this guy here. I thank you that I uh, tithe and that I fast um, twice a week. I thank you for that. And the tax collector guy can't even lift his head. He's just beating his chest, saying, have mercy on me, God, a sinner. So we fall into that category. Our, our, we are puffed up in our pride by our religious duties. Here's how we are. We, are. we believe all the right doctrine. And we pray theologically robust prayers. And we, not a Sunday or Wednesday goes by that we're not seen serving in the church. But here's the main thing that Christ has against us. We've forgotten that our sins put him on the cross too. It's not just the, the crazy liberal talking heads on TV whose sins put Jesus on the cross. You're right next to them. You follow me? And I pick talking liberal heads because those are the people that we tend to rail on the most. But we're right there with them. The religious pride, and this is the pride that Jesus has little patience for. And you might be shocked to hear that Jesus has little patience for some people, but you should read the passage where he flips over the tables and he calls the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. You look alive, but you're dead on the inside. 
He has little patience for it. In Luke 12, 47 and 48, he talks about, uh, he's using this parable and he says, look, the servant who knew the master's will but didn't do it will receive a severe beating. But the servant who didn't know the will of the Lord, he's going to receive a beating, but it's going to be much less severe. And that's uh, that's, that correlates here with this. How dare you and I be prideful when we hear the gospel preached week in and week out. The gospel is one of grace and of mercy, and we'll get to it here in a minute. How dare we preach something other than that? We are like the Galatians who Paul said, who has bewitched you? Who's tricked you? You started out with gospel and then you wound up with law. You started off with we're saved by grace and you wound up trying to work off salvation. You know what that sounds like? That is literally like this. You might think I'm crazy, but this is what it's like. It's like you sitting in church, me and you sitting in church, hearing week in, week out, the way to get to the gospel, the way to get to God is to go left. You go left, so left, y'all's left, okay? You go left, but then you go and you preach and you say, you go right, you idiot. See, because legalism breeds contempt for other people. You're not as good as I am. You stay away from me. And so we don't just say, go right. Go right. So go right, you idiot. My gosh, why can't you understand this? When all the while Jesus is saying, go left. With a sweet and gracious and merciful voice. But religious pride leads us to beat the gospel, beat people over the head with the word of God, with the gospel. It's supposed to go left graciously and we're screaming to go right in a vicious manner. Here's what I know we must do as a church. We must feel the weight of our own sin. We have got to stop assuming that of course God would forgive me. Why wouldn't he? He's God. Yeah, he is God, but he he doesn't owe you and I anything. He doesn't have to forgive me for all the times that I have violated my relationship with him, that I have sought out other lovers besides Jesus Christ. He doesn't have to, but he still does. We have to understand the weight of our sin. Um, I think I used this analogy for something else a couple years ago, but I'll use it in another way. Uh, When I was a kid in Brazil, we had an IMB uh, journeyman who uh, homeschooled us down the street from our house. And I was a mischievous little guy. And and I don't mean like like, uh, put a frog in the teacher's desk. I was like mean. I was just mean. Okay? And so that's what I mean by mischievous. And, and many times I'd get in trouble and it would be kind of minor things and she would just deal with me there. But sometimes I would do major things and she'd walk me home. And the walk home was unbearable. Do you remember this as a kid? Your mom saying, dad will be home soon. <laughs> right? You're just sitting there. You don't know what to do with the 30 minutes that you have. See, there's no time in that walk home where I'm thinking about how I didn't do anything wrong and being proud. There's no time for that now. I am indicted. I am on my way to I see the results of my sin. I am going to be in trouble. That's how we must be with our sin against God. It can't be, yeah, but it's okay. There'll be grace. Listen, listen there is grace, but there's not grace for people who act flippantly like that. Romans 6 is very serious about that. You can't just say, yeah, but there's grace. We can keep on going. Grace is not for you, my friend, if that's you. We must understand that the cross of Jesus Christ puts the blame squarely on our shoulders. This, is, this, this sermon tonight goes hand in hand with what Dan preached this morning, grace and truth. You're like, I don't hear a lot of grace yet, right? We'll get to it. Um, this is the truth part. I've switched them. Okay, we're not doing grace and truth. We're doing truth and grace. Or he might have done truth first. I don't remember. Anyways, um, this is the truth part. We would be unloving if we didn't tell you this. This is the truth part. You are guilty. You are guilty of the biggest crime ever committed in human history. You and I killed the Son of God. You might say, well, I think the Jews did. Or uh, Isaiah 53 says it was God's will to crush him. Yes, all those things. Yes, a thousand times. Yes, but a thousand times also your sin and my sin put him on the cross as well. Everyone was in on it. That's the truth that we need to hear. And then comes grace, and this is where you got to buckle up. you got to buckle up because hopefully you're going to see how insane the grace of God is for us. This is incredible. First, got to talk about shame before we, we move on. 
Shame, this is where things get really interesting. See, usually in our lives when we commit sin, there comes that shame. I don't need to preach on it. You guys understand that, that horrible feeling. You don't want to talk to anyone. You want to run and hide, just like Adam and Eve wanted to run and hide in the Garden of Eden. We all know the shame. Usually when we sin out of pride, shame comes. But here's the crazy thing that happens at the cross of Jesus Christ. Our biggest moment of pride to date was that day when he was crucified and our shame was dispelled immediately. It was gone. Let me show you the second part of Isaiah 53, 5. Let's just read the whole thing. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. That's what we've already looked at. Now listen to this. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. So God most definitely has a case against us. Our sin has put Jesus on the cross, but then he does something that is completely against everything in our nature. Instead of punishing us, he punishes Jesus. And then, to make things even crazier, the punishment that was placed on Jesus actually brought you and I peace. Are you following the language here? Your peace and your healing that you feel in the gospel was birthed out of the chastisement and the stripes that were placed upon Jesus. It comes through that. In the same way that Noah and those eight people were brought safely through the flood, 1 Peter 3 says, we are brought safely through the cross. And so... I need us, you need yourself to understand this. Like, you haven't understood the gospel really unless you have wrestled with the fact that God could be so gracious there. Like, how on earth could he be so gracious? My sin led to Jesus' death and then I go free. I don't understand. I don't understand that. At some point, you've got to think, how is that possible? If you don't think, if you haven't thought that, then maybe you don't really understand what's going on, or you're just taking it for granted in a big way. What does this mean for us? It means no more shame. See, here's what we need to understand from the language again. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Now he's prophesying, I understand that, but he's prophesying about something that would happen some 700 years in the future, but for us happened 2,000 years in the past. So listen to the language. His chastisement brought you peace on that day. It was brought, it was purchased for you on that day. Jesus made a transaction. He bought your peace and he bought your healing. He bought my peace and my healing. And when he showed up at the cash register, he said how much and God told him Everything. Your life. Everything. That's the transaction he made. It's not an ongoing deal. He's not paying it off. He didn't put it on layaway. It was done 2,000 years ago. It's over with. There's no more shame for us. Our peace has been brought forth through the chastisement of Jesus. Our healing has been made with his stripes. So i got to ask tonight, and this is what we'll end with. We'll go really short tonight. Where are you at in all of that? Did you need to hear the truth part more? Like you are guilty? Did you need to hear uh, the grace part more? Like, hey, there's no more shame. There's therefore now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. My guess is that uh, it's probably a mixture. A mixture of both since they, uh, the pride and the shame, they feed off one another. We're all there. The application tonight is not a lot. Here's all I want you to do. I want you to medicate, or medicate, no. (laughs) Some of you need to medicate, but that's not my prescription there, okay? Um, Meditate on the truths you've just heard. I'll summarize them again. You are implicated as an accomplice in the most important and devastating murder of all time by the high court of heaven, which means your prideful insistence that you're not a bad person is a most offensive stance to take. And God's response to your pride is to free you from shame forever. 
<laughs> it sounds crazy to say. You did all this horrible stuff. You killed Jesus Christ. You stomped on him with your sin, and God's response is for you to go free forever and to live in community with him forever in heaven one day. How often do you meditate on that? Has church become about the right statements to make, the right people to know, your favorite songs, your favorite program, your place in Camp Crestview? One of the most beautiful things in all of Scripture to me is that after Adam and Eve um, sinned against God and after he had already had to uh, punish them along with Satan, he killed animals to make them clothes, to cover up their shame. He said, your, your effort to cover up just, just wouldn't do it. Let me kill some animals to cover you up, to cover your shame, to make you clothes. That was a foreshadowing of what he did at the cross of Jesus Christ. He said, look, all your good efforts, they're just not going to do. Those aren't going to do. Let me, let me kill my son, okay? Uh, and then you can have his righteousness. How about that? That's why we sing, okay? That's why we get up and come to church when we don't really feel like it. That's why we help people um, do things when we'd rather stay at home and watch TV. That's why you should go to the hospital when one of your friends is there, even though it's late at night. If, if the gospel of Jesus doesn't get you going, you will never get going. You will live on shots of adrenaline the rest of your life. You'll be high on some sermon. You'll be high on some new favorite worship song. You'll be high on some program that you thought up. You'll be high because we had a high, a high Sunday in, in attendance here in the worship service, but it won't ever last the only thing that can last is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You did everything wrong, yet you don't pay a price. Jesus did nothing wrong. He pays the whole price. Let's pray. God, help us truly grasp your word. God, help us truly grasp your, <laughs> your seemingly insane grace towards us. It doesn't make sense to our natural minds, but you have put it in your word. You have caused us to believe it. You have brought us near by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we believe it. God, that it would, please help it shape us, shape who we are. Help us identify with our pride, identify with the fact that we put your son to death. God, because only when we do that can we accept the free offer of grace. Help us, Father. Whatever area we need help in, those two areas tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand and sing with us. We've got one more song, and here's what I want you to think about. And if you've never accepted Christ, made Christ your Lord and your Savior, uh, I just prayed it in my prayer. Look, it can't, that forgiveness, that grace, that mercy cannot be yours unless you lay your pride down once and for all. So if you want to do that, you can do that tonight. I'll be down here in the front. You can come talk to me about that. If you came with a friend, you can go find them. I don't care who you talk to. I just want you to make that decision. And Christians, we aren't exempt from doing work either. Um, did you need to be hit in the face with the fact that you killed Jesus? Or did you need to be picked up by the fact that you could be free from shame forever? Wherever you're at, be encouraged tonight. Let's sing.